Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Essentials, unity, and non-essentials, liberty, and all things, charity. Liberty and non-essentials, and the love and grace that is to be shown in all things is the theme of Romans chapter 14. God never intended for us in the church to be cookie-cutter Christians. He has given different gifts to His church, and He uses our diverse personalities, all for the purpose that his church might have a greater outreach and reach more for him and with his gospel of grace. With all of us being different, it is not wrong to have different likes and dislikes. In Christ, unity and individuality are friends, not enemies. As we live by grace and we put grace into action, we must receive and accept one another and the differences that are among us. We are called to be one to work together, to serve together, but we cannot ignore the fact that we are all different in this one body. We have different viewpoints, different opinions, different paths, different preferences, different ways of solving problems. We each have our own set of convictions about life and its gray areas and what may or may not are, affect our relationship with the Lord. We like to think that life is black and white, but there are gray areas in the Christian life. And by grace, God wants His church to receive one another with the differences that are among us and to dwell in unity and harmony. And Romans chapter 14 is a very practical chapter that explains how this is done. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4 read, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. This chapter of God's word centers around phrases like, one believeth one thing, another believeth another thing. One esteemeth one thing, another esteemeth another. One regardeth one thing, another regardeth another thing. And so you see Paul's referring to differing opinions, differing convictions among members in the church in non-essential areas. And Paul presents a strong plea here for grace and understanding among the members of Christ's body in the gray areas in matters of conduct that are not necessarily forbidden, but neither are they promoted in the Word of God. The food we eat and the days we observe are brought up as examples here by our Apostle Paul. In these gray areas where people have strong opinions can touch many other areas of life, uh, such as going to movies, playing card games, celebrating holidays, going to a restaurant that sells alcohol, listening to certain music, schooling choices, drinking coffee, playing pool, the clothes we wear, and on and on it goes. These kind of issues are not sin issues, they're preference issues. There are some things in life and from Scripture that are just absolutely crystal clear. The Bible is plain that we should not commit adultery, kill, steal, lie, have corrupt speech, be bitter, murmur, and so on and so on. These things are beyond debate, and we th with those things, God's Word is clear. However, there are other areas of life that are not so clear, and not doing certain things in gray areas often helps a person feel closer to the Lord. However, this may not be true for someone else in the body of Christ. But the teaching of God's Word is to accept these differences and to not judge or criticize those who have different convictions in these kind of areas. Paul says to receive him that is weak in the faith, 
To receive in the Greek implies to accept, warmly receive, embrace, and welcome. In other words, there is nothing hypocritical about it. It is a sincere acceptance of another believer. It is to take someone for who they are and where they are at and to accept them. Right then, right there. Paul says to receive them not to doubtful disputations. Or don't dispute and argue with that person over doubtful things. Over things of secondary importance where there is liberty. One who is weak in the faith reminds us that in the church, the church is made up of individuals at all kinds of different levels of spirituality. But we need to accept the spiritually weak and the spiritually strong and everyone in between. There are those who are fully aware of the grace and freedom that they enjoy in Christ and they live accordingly. On the other hand, there are those who walk in constant fear of becoming defiled with the contamination of the world and they live accordingly. And both are to accept and receive one another. Believers often restrict their love and acceptance and make it conditional. If you do this or won't do this, then I will accept you. But that's not Christ-like, and that's not His love and His unconditional acceptance. Romans 15, 7 says, Receive one another as Christ also received us. And that's unconditional love and acceptance, warts and all, because that's how Christ accepts and loves each of us. The faith here, the, him that is weak in the faith, is speaking of the faith revealed to the Apostle Paul for this dispensation of grace. And so, in other words, it's speaking of living by the grace of God and the liberty that we have in Christ today under grace. And Paul speaks of one who believeth that we may eat all things. This speaks of a believer who walks in full enjoyment of our liberty in Christ, that has faith based on the teachings of grace for today, that all foods are clean, as 1 Timothy 4, 4-5 says, is true for today. But there are believers who feel closer to the Lord by putting restrictions on what they eat, and that they need to eat healthier since our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so the one who is weak here believes that eating only herbs or being a vegetarian is more spiritual and makes them closer to the Lord, and thus they put this self-imposed rule upon themselves. Paul's instruction is that the believer who believes they can eat all things should not despise his brother. Despise there means to consider of little value, to look down on. And the one who only eats vegetables and puts restrictions on themselves, feeling that this is pleasing to God, is taught here, don't judge or condemn the one who eats all things as being unspiritual. Because Paul says God has received him or accepted him. Paul's wording turned strong in verse 4. He says, who are you? And what right do you have to sit in judgment of another man's servant? To judge another believer's conduct as if you were their master. That other brother is not your servant. In other words, they aren't accountable to you. They're accountable to God. It is before our own master that each of us stands or falls. It's not for the weaker or stronger brother to say what is right and wrong in debatable gray areas. It's wrong for anyone to judge, criticize, or interfere in the relationship between the servant and God, his master, in a non-essential area. God holds up and sustains those on both sides of this question. One should not call another unspiritual for living in their liberty, and one should not look down on others as immature for trying to live closer to the Lord. When we refuse to accept a brother or sister in Christ because they do not adhere to your own personal conviction on a certain gray area, we are actually holding them to a higher standard than the Lord himself does. God accepts us in Christ by grace. Therefore, we are taught to accept one another in Christ by grace as well. Romans 14, verses 5 through 12 read, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. 
For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Paul moves on to deal with days. The word esteemeth speaks of separating aside a certain day and placing a higher value on one day from another, regarding it more sacred than others. It speaks of one who would make much of a certain day as being holy and set apart unto the Lord, whereas another brother esteemeth every day alike. In other words, that brother would believe that every day should be dedicated to the Lord and that every day is an important day and belongs to the Lord and is to be set apart for him. But Paul says that the person who treats a certain day as sacred does so unto the Lord to honor him. And the person who treats every day as sacred and set apart alike does so unto the Lord to honor him. And Paul says the one who eats all things, give thanks, gives thanks to God and does so unto the Lord. And the one who abstains from eating all things, gives thanks to the God and does so unto the Lord. In both cases, God is honored and God is thanked. The important thing in these non-essential areas is that they're done for the Lord and for His glory, and that they are done sincerely with complete conviction, being fully persuaded in their mind that what they are doing is right and that it's not done out of pride. And very simply, that is how these situations are to be left in gray areas like this. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. In non-essential areas, we should all search the scriptures, pray about it for guidance, and then become fully persuaded in your own mind, seeking to do what you think is most pleasing to the Lord, doing what makes you grow in your relationship toward the Lord. This principle of being fully convinced in your own mind, it only applies to secondary non-essential areas when it comes to essential, fundamental doctrines of the faith, such as salvation from our sins and the inspiration of God's Word and, and Christ's deity, there's no room for individual opinions. But in gray areas where things are neither right nor wrong in themselves, there is room for differing views. And there's the opportunity to show grace to others. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute but first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Romans is a hardcover 452-page verse-by-verse commentary written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stan. Paul's epistle to the Romans is one of the most profound, yet one of the most enlightening books of the Bible, indeed of all literature. Nowhere else in the Bible do we find the great doctrines of the Christian faith set forth so completely or systematically. Thus, we wholeheartedly agree with the statement, the book of Romans is the Bible within the Bible. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262 262- 255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine The Berean Searchlight call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Paul says that none of us live or die to ourselves. In other words, we're not an island unto ourselves. Our lives affects other people around us. And Paul shows here how our life is a matter between us and the Lord. 
By Christ's death and resurrection for us, when we trust him as our personal savior, we belong to him and he is our Lord. And so our ultimate responsibility always goes back to him because we are the Lord and he is Lord over us. We don't live to ourselves, but to the Lord. We don't die to ourselves, but to the Lord. Both in life and death, we belong to the Lord. Paul is emphasizing that the Lord should be the goal and focus of the lives of his people. In these gray areas, we are to remember that we are the Lord's and therefore the decisions we make in these areas are to be made in light of our relationship with the Lord and in light of the Lord's ownership of us. We don't live under ourselves, so we should not make these decisions in these areas just, on base, just based on what we feel or what we would like to do, but on what we are convinced that the Lord wants us to do, what the Lord's will is in this area. What this is all telling us is that we are all to live for the audience of one, for our Lord and Savior. In light of the fact that we are all the Lord's, Paul's next question is, why are you judging and condemning your brother? Christ is Lord over that brother, not you. And that brother, as well as yourself, will have to give an account before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. The motivation here is that instead of judging other believers, we better judge our own conduct and make sure it's well-pleasing unto him because we will all individually give an account for our actions before our Lord one day. Before his supreme authority as Lord and God, we each, with no one excluded in the body of Christ, we will all bow before him and willingly. We will all confess our actions before him, and we will each give an account of our lives and service before him. Paul is saying that none of us are given an account for someone else's actions. We'll only give an account of our own actions at the judgment seat of Christ. And Paul shows that it is not our job to judge others. That's the Lord's job at the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, verses 13 through 18 read, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. This passage is really about meddling, so don't blame the, the messenger. It's, it's the Word of God as, we, as it talks about these practical areas of our life. And Paul says, don't judge anymore. Believers then, believers now are all the same. It shows how prone they were back then and how prone we all are today to judge others as God's Word is timeless and it applies even now. One commentator says this about judging. Our ability to judge has several shortcomings. We are not omniscient, so our judgment does, doesn't have all the facts. We are not objective, so our judgment is tainted by self-interest. We are not perfect, so our judgment is hypocritical. We are not God, so our judgment has no jurisdiction. In these verses, the question is answered. Can two believers have two different opinions and both be right? And the answer is yes. If a believer is fully persuaded in his own mind that a certain non-essential doctrine or godly practice is correct, that conviction can be right before the Lord. As verse 14 says, there is nothing unclean of itself. Foods, no foods, no days are. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But another can have a different opinion and be right before the Lord as well. Both opinions can be right so long as both these believers do or teach these things with a Christ-honoring spirit and motive. There is liberty and non-essentials, 
and believers can have different opposing views and both be right before God. So you can say, I'm never going to darken the door of a movie theater because I think it's a bad testimony, worldly, and supports Hollywood's horrible lifestyle, and you are absolutely right before the Lord. Or you can say, I don't have any problem with going to a movie theater. It doesn't affect my relationship with the Lord at all. I go with a clear conscience, and you are absolutely right before the Lord. When one of these two believers is wrong is when one of them tries to judge the other and condemn their practice and force their opinions on another as being the only right one. Or they can be wrong by purposely doing what the other disagrees right in front of them. These things can then lead a believer to be a stumbling block in a brother's way and cause him or her to fall in their walk with the Lord. That's amazing to me here, too, in verse 15, how it says that it's even possible to destroy a brother as far as their Christian experience is concerned. Paul's instruction is that if eating meat in front of the weaker brother who doesn't will destroy him or really discourage him or grieve him in his Christian walk, it is better to refrain from eating it so as not to become a stumbling block to him and to his faith. And the believer is to be mindful, there's a convicting part put in there in verse 15, mindful of the fact that Christ died for that brother in Christ, we have a difference of opinion with, when he says, for whom Christ died. And so that teaches and reminds us that Christ loves that person so deeply. And so out of Christ's selfless love and care, we should therefore be more than willing to keep from doing something or anything that might hurt another believer in their walk with the Lord. Paul in verse 17 speaks of the kingdom of God in its broadest sense. It speaks of the overall kingdom of God, which includes Israel's earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom, which is reserved for the church, the body of Christ. And in both cases, Paul says that the kingdom of God and the earth and heaven is not meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Dietary regulations, what a person eats and drinks or doesn't eat and drink, isn't what really matters and truly matters. God's spiritual realities in our lives are what really matters. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit should be applied and known of believers in their lives and should be exhibited in gray areas such as this. We should do what's right with righteousness by the Holy Spirit. What makes for peace among believers by the Holy Spirit? And this will result in joy among believers by the Holy Spirit. Living by and in these things is acceptable to our Lord and approved of men, Paul says. Romans 14, verses 19 through 23 read, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Paul says we are to follow after the things which make for peace. And that word follow means to pursue with effort. Uh, Self-denial, humility, grace, thoughtfulness. And non-essential areas are all needed in order for there to be unity between believers with differences of convictions in these things. And we are to follow after, pursue after things we may may edify another. In other words, the believer is not to be a wrecking ball tearing down believers around them. Instead, we are to be building each other up. It is more important to give up our rights for the good of our brother in Christ to encourage them and to demand and assert our rights in these things. The word destroy in verse 20 is the opposite of the word edify. Destroy speaks of pulling down, and edify speaks of pulling or building up. So we see here how the Lord's doing a work in the life of each of His own in the body of Christ. And it's a sobering thought 
to think of hindering that work in the life of another brother in secondary matters. By our actions and lack of love and selfishness, we can actually destroy and pull down the gracious work God is doing in the life of a believer up to that point. Verse 21 teaches how the believer is to make a definitive effort to avoid meat or drink or anything which might offend or cause a believer to stumble or weaken their faith. Any non-essential gray area that is a matter of conviction for another believer should be avoided in order to, by grace, build that brother up in the Lord. Paul says to the stronger brother, hast thou faith? In other words, you have strong faith in your liberty in God's grace? He says, have it to yourself before God. Don't flaunt your strong faith before others. Have it before God. If you have faith that a gray area activity is right, hold that conviction privately before God and don't parade it before others. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And Paul says, happy is the man that doesn't condemn himself by allowing himself to exercise his liberty in Christ to purposely partake of the thing which he allows in his life before another believer who does not do the same. And in verse 23, Paul's thought is that if a believer does do those things in which he doubts is good before another believer who has different beliefs and which will cause that believer to fall, He's damned, which speaks of self-condemnation. A man is condemned by his own conscience. And this is sin before God because the stronger brother has not acted in faith, but instead in self-will, knowingly pulling down another believer and possibly destroying the work of God in that person's life. There's much practical instruction here, isn't there? And Really, what it shows you is that we need to take such great care and thoughtfulness in the Christian life to make sure, sure we're showing the proper respect for our fellow members of the body of Christ and that we're showing love for God's people. And this chapter is a call by God to grace and understanding in non-essential areas. God in His grace, He lifts us and He lifts us up high and God's grace as it works in our lives will cause us to lift others up, put them first, receive them, treat them with God's kindness and care. Thank you for watching this episode of Transformed by Grace. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God for more information, visit our website at www.BereanBibleSociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.